at the end of each podcast episode, I'm going to recommend a podcast that somehow or another ties into this episode. So please listen to the whole episode of the podcast because I guarantee you, the podcast I recommend you're going to love. Years ago, actually many, many years ago, I got my degree in radio. And I was in radio for a while. And needless to say, I learned a lot when I went to school for it. Podcasting was not really a thing back then. When I went, yes, it was that long ago. But podcasting is growing and growing even more. People are still getting into radio. Now, you may hear some people say that radio is dying. That is, no, that is not true at all. Radio is alive and well. And, of course, podcasting is growing as well. Well, on this episode of Conversations with Rich Bennett, I'm going to be talking to three gentlemen about radio and about podcasting. You could say they're, um, well, they're fighting owls. I know you're probably wondering what I'm talking about there, but you're about to find out. Enjoy the conversation. Coming to you from the Freedom Federal Credit Union Studios, Harford County Living presents Conversations with Rich Bennett. Come on, you're faster than with me. Guys. Yeah. Oh man, you Come already on. said it. I was gonna ask her if she remembered the date. Sitting here today, I have how do I say this? We have um three smooth, jazzy, rocking owls. <laughs> On with a uh, sure, I, I don't, <laughs> sure that works right. Yeah, that works. So, <laughs> yeah. I have Terry Troyer, Matt Terry, and oh my God, Paul, I forgot your last name already. Chufo, Chufo. Yeah. For some reason, I was going to say Paul Schaefer, but he don't have a keyboard in front of him, <laughs> so I knew it wasn't that. That's um, right, Rich. <laughs> God, that was Wait, good. So, I like that. So, I was going to say, are you the one that's uh, doing all the? different character voices on oh, the radio yeah. there <laughs> yeah, this like, is the rich bandit podcast do, 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 like do. kermit and all that <laughs> who does kermit that, oh that's matt that's yeah. me that's matt okay so i have the three from whfc 91.1 fm the college station which of course you can also listen to at whfc 911.org right exactly right? Mm-hmm. and it's well, God, one of the things I noticed um, that I'm getting a lot of good feedback on is the format change. Yep. Mm-hmm. So yep. Uh, you guys want to go into that a little bit? Because I know before the morning, it's, it was always jazz, which I still, thank God Terry's still doing the jazz in the morning. Don't ever take that away. Mm. Um, and, the, <laughs> and then classical music. But you guys have changed that up. And I was telling somebody the other day, Cause I'm sitting as I'm working and I got WHFC on and I even put a post up there. And then the next thing I know my foot's going, I'm like, wait a minute. I, I thought I had Spotify or something on, on a playlist. And I'm like, Oh my God, they're playing Judas priest. I was like, wow. And so I mean, much just, more. Oh yeah. It made my day. I mean, it's, I love it because I can, you can, I can hear Judas priest. And then all of a sudden I'm here and run DMC. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, it just blows me away. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're focused more towards the students now. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll lead with this and, and just say that, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do and we aren't doing is to create a student learning lab, which is, uh, of course, you know, focused on the students and training them for future careers in broadcasting, or maybe not in broadcasting because public speaking is going to be a part of what they'll do, okay? Right. And so uh, last year, and actually in, in 2020, is when we uh, said, hey, we need to circle back to the purpose of this radio station, and that is to be student-centric uh, with strong collaboration, build a team, uh, myself, Paul, uh, there's Matt, there's Nasia also, uh, and get things done. And part of that was, you know, attracting a new audience. And mm-hmm. 
also a part of it was getting music on that students would really like. And, and we found it. I mean, I mean, I'm blown away personally because, you know, I was uh, one of those uh, top rock and boss jocks when a lot of this stuff was out, <laughs> you know, on different frequencies throughout the United States. And then I'm hearing these students talk about it like it's like they were right there when I was right. doing it on, on, on commercial radio, right? So it's, it's really rewarding. Uh, we're teaching a lot uh, uh, about broadcasting, uh, e even beyond with our podcasting component that's yep. there. Uh, we are reach, we're reaching out into our Hartford Community College uh, community and inviting all the different disciplines to come in and join us in different ways and talk about what's going on. And uh, like I said, it's really a good thing. And I'm going to hand it off to Paul because Paul uh, has been the primary architect uh, of the format. And he probably has even more to say. And, and uh, well, Paul, if you want to chime in, go ahead. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you. It's um... So like uh, we, our main purpose is to, to create a really strong learning lab and, and recruit as many students as we can. We were in a, we're in a two year college. Mm -hmm. We're going to need constantly new people uh, create more interest in what we're playing and what we're doing and what we're teaching. So, um, the students have uh, the first, the first thousand songs were basically in my own record collection <laughs> and then, really? and then, yeah. And then, and then it's uh, expanded out from there uh, vastly. I mean, people are bringing in lots of music. Yeah. It's funny how how um, 19, 20 year olds are obsessed with eighties music. But, oh, I you know, know. If if they love eighties music, that's what they love. It's it's great, you know. And they they feel like they've just discovered it, just like Terry was saying. Like yeah, like this is like the hey, I just I just found a new band, Journey. <laughs> Have you ever heard of them? <laughs> no, <laughs> and that's great. And that's great. Who are I they? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the things that always got me, you know, because I DJ a lot of events and everything, and to have these young kids uh, come up and ask me, for, not even just 80s, but 70s and 60s music, I'm like, all right, where's your father at? Where's your mother? They're sending you up here asking for these requests. You do not know who these bands are. Oh, no, I listen to them all. The and you, and they'll rattle off the songs and history. I was like, yep. it just floors me. Yeah, but you're seeing a lot more cover bands out there too, and they're covering this stuff too. Oh yeah, yeah. Now I can hear them at night from um, like the from the tents of like Black Eyed Susie's and yeah, the, the top of the tower and all that stuff. You can hear the bands playing. I think there was one at Looney's last night. They were playing like Survivor or something. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, up to you. But what I like about it too is is because my daughter who's 20 has even mentioned to me because she came downstairs in the office. And at the time Terry was on and she's like, Oh, who is that? That, that is good. I never heard guitar playing like that. And Oh my God. His name just went right out of my head. Terry, you play him all the time too. Mm. Um, the jazz guitarist. Uh, Wes Montgomery. Yes, thank you. Oh yeah, Wes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I get and a lot of my, requests for Wes Montgomery music. Yeah, but my daughter's like, "That's really good." And it's it was where she was into the boy bands earlier, like One Direction and all that. But now she likes that, and she's likes uh, you know like Greta Van. F when I told her you guys played Greta Van Fleet on the station the other day, she was blown away. Yeah, I have, that's I have her a, band now. It's Greta Van yeah. Fleet. <laughs> I, ha I have a I have a hard drive that has like at least half a dozen Greta Van Fleet songs that I need to add in when we get the new system rolling. So, all right, yeah. with the music, because I take it, Paul, that you're the one that does all the music programming, or a majority well, of it. Yeah, a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. So, explain to everybody how that works, because college radio is different than public radio. Or regular right. radio, yeah. mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those you never know what you're going to get kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, especially when we're on automation and, you know, I've, I've created lists of serious juxtapositions between like wild things, like you were saying, like Run DMC and Judas Priest. <laughs> but, right. um, you know, uh, I think of it as a music discovery vehicle for, for people like, you know, hear new things but also think about music in a different way right you know like we do all these we've there were all these surveys that were done over the years with with listeners 
and they were supposed to mark off who they like, what they, what kind of styles they like to listen to. And 90% of them marked off like 10 to 15 styles. You know, wow. I mean, there's, there's, there's no, there's no niche when it comes to people's interest in music mm -hmm. in that way. I mean, there's niche radio stations so they can find this or that, but you know, tossing them all together, um, ideally would <laughs> draw the people who are into a, a you know, eclectic mix of, of different right. things. Um, you know, that remains to be seen. We don't really have that much data, listener data, but you know, we're working on that actually with the sociology department. <laughs> we're trying to get well, students to work in. I think it, for those people that love music like myself, I think it opens them up to learn more too about mm -hmm. music because I mean, me, I can sit there and listen to opera and then turn right around and listen to heavy metal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I just like to, I like all different types of music. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it allows people to do that. Whereas I think you, now you guys are offering more than you were a few years ago. If I'm not, if I'm not, I mean, that's just me. That's what I, I'm seeing out of it because it's, and the students too, it's, yeah. I love it because you could, some of them, you, some of them sound like they've been in radio for years for as professionals. Yeah. Some, yeah. you can tell they're new to it, which I love. I love to hear that because as they do it longer, you can hear them getting better. And I mm -hmm. guess just as a disc jockey, maybe that's why I like it. But yeah. I, I just I, I find it awesome that you know, you have these kids that are out there and they want to learn it and they're doing it and just some of them have mispronounced some names of artists, but that's oh, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. How else are you going to learn about it unless you do? Yeah, you yeah, know? and the kids come like ready and willing to learn. That's the the great thing so far. Like, yeah. You don't have any kids that are here just sort of like just to do it because eh, whatever, like they're all into it and they're all preparing and they're all spending time, like figuring out what their, what their, their, their ideal show is going to be. And a lot of them writing scripts before they come in. That's great. Um, yeah. And you know, it, and then like calling me up and asking like, Hey, um, do you know if we have this or that on the, in the seat, like they, they're like preparing days and days ahead. So Mm -hmm. it's been really fantastic and the community volunteers that have come in recently are just out of this world right you know um, so how many students actually are behind the controls now uh behind the controls we have 21 really yeah it, it didn't used to be that many was it no no Ooh. this is a new height of okay people yeah yeah um, also, especially also with, the, with the with well, sorry uh, go ahead yeah i just wanted to say rich that uh it's also rewarding uh, to hear and 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 see the progression of the young mm -hmm. individuals who come on board, uh, and uh, they ask questions. That's that's a beauty. That's a beautiful. Yeah, thing. they ask questions. They want to learn, and they're enthusiastic. And I always I, I you know tell the staff all the time, like, wow, listen to this really fresh enthusiasm that we have, and that spills over to listening. So there's yes. a connection, and and once you get that emotional component in, I want, don't want to sound too you know <laughs> academic here, but um, but once you get those components together, you have a winning combination, and that's what we're driving for, and we're seeing it. We're seeing an increase in all the different uh, areas. As a matter of fact, I just got information in on our um, audience numbers, and whereas we had decrease because of covid because of the format change and things going on uh you know now we've uh, at least gone and add at least 1100 uh persons to our cum listening per week nice. you know because we had pretty much gone down you know right. and uh but now we're starting to see the rebuild so it means what we're doing is working and now the key is just to be consistent with what we're doing it Excuse me, I'm sorry. If you can explain to everybody, like, because programming has changed for people that listened years ago to now, explain to everybody the differences, what the programming you have going on now is, in other words, the different shows and so forth. Okay, Paul, you, you can handle that. I'm just, uh, you know, basically giving. Terry it. says, I'm just along for the ride, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I quit. I'm out of here. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, when we when we changed the format, we didn't want to lose any of the community volunteers that we've had here for a long time because they've been doing such an amazing job for so long. Uh, we did have to move classical for the most part to the weekends, mm. um, and several of the the weekday uh, volunteers moved to the weekends and are doing a phenomenal job. Um, and actually, they've <laughs> they came to me and said, you know, I've I've always wanted to play like George. I've always wanted to play like Broadway show stuff. Can can I can I do that? I'm like, dude, of course you can. <laughs> He's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> he just went wild. <laughs> so I mean. It's been it's been great to see people sort of like the the volunteers like opening up and, and exploring lots of new things. Right. Um, so we decided to to because the students are here during the weekdays, mostly like the the large chunk of the weekday hours are going to be AAA, and right now it's from nine to six. Um, I'm I'm sorry to say, pretty soon within a month seven to six. So huh? we're, the morning shows we have we have I'm, i am actively developing them a new morning show with the students as a as a learning experience to develop a, a new morning show i'm so sorry but it's just you're taking happen. my terry away <laughs> yeah well terry wants to be an exact he wants to be the station manager he wants to be the executive he's no more <laughs> he doesn't want to be waking up at four in the morning to get here <laughs> Man, I guess I'm going to have to create a new playlist with Wes Montgomery and all on it now. We did change the overnights from the New Age music to jazz. Uh, okay. So from from 12 to will be 7, and eventually maybe 12 a.m. 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. will be will be jazz because uh, we're going to try to expand the morning show after we get it settled. So Rich is going to have to become an insomniac. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was the you know, funny thing is because well, I'm always up earlier, and I, I I was hearing like the flute was it the you know that that I guess new age or whatever. Um, yeah. So now, of course, when I get up, I I hear Terry. And now I, it's all right. Yeah, I, yeah. I I can still listen. I'll I'll I got <laughs> you got to give it a shot. That's the yeah. thing. Yeah. And that's yeah. and with the changes you guys made, I gave it a shot and loved it. Cool. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, Terry, to, are you going to be on on the weekends at least? Uh, that I don't know. Stay <laughs> tuned. You'll find yeah. out. <laughs> we'll see how much he starts to miss it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he will. So yeah, and then uh, you know Saturdays we we still have like jazz in the morning uh, for for a couple hours, and then we have Golden Age, like the same programming and we actually have a a, a, a a student volunteer actually putting together golden age now which is great so you are yeah. keeping the golden age of radio oh of course and we actually found Thank we you. actually oh yeah. yeah we actually found um a treasure trove thirty thousand hours of of golden age of golden age broadcasts that we can really so we're, it's going to be around for a long time so that's good know, because I, I, yeah to me that's teaching the, not just kids, but even adults, the history of radio, how, yeah. and TV technically, mm -hmm. right. because a lot of those radio shows became television shows and they're hard to find anymore. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, great. I'm glad you're not taking that away. All right. Oh, yeah. So you can take Terry away as long as you keep going to major radio. I'm yeah. fine. Yeah. But... Yeah. Thanks, Rich. I really appreciate that. <laughs> And we did a lot to streamline like certain things that, that that sort of jumped out that didn't necessarily fit. Like we wanted to move the classical to the weekends, right? So so you know we we stopped running like uh, Ozark Highlands and Bluegrass and all those things. And they're mm -hmm. great shows, but like it didn't fit. We we created a Sunday from like seven a.m. until four p.m. That's all classical now, right? So um, and then Ed does his thing and. You know, we've kind of we're trying to re not rely on the national programs as much. Uh, we're being very careful and choosy about the national programs we want. Right. Like, like we love Rockin' in the Days of Confusion. Um, we love FM Odyssey. You know, like those things are like in LA Theater Works, like really great national programs that we want to keep going. But you guys are actually giving your. To me, it seems like you're. Well, you, it doesn't seem like you are. You're giving more of that local feel. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Which is yeah. Good. 
Yeah, and that yeah. was one of the objectives. Uh, when we sat down, we said, uh, you know, as, as much live and local and being local centric as we possibly could, mm -hmm. uh, because there are so many benefits that come along with that. Uh, one, the fact that you have these fresh new voices and students on the air. Two, uh, especially in the underwriting category, uh, we have a lot of alum that's here in the area and they are running businesses. And I'm certainly, I'm certainly sure that uh, they can uh, kind of relate to that because when they mm -hmm. first came through the doors of Harvard Community College, they were raw recruits. They, they didn't know much about business. They didn't know much about sociology, psychology, nursing, right? But it took time for them to learn it. This was the first step. So in a way they can relate to these young broadcasters coming on board and learning the trade. And part of that leads into our workforce commitments to get them ready for the workforce. So like I said right. earlier, whether they choose to be in broadcasting or uh, the business world or uh, become an instructor, you're going to be using your vocal cords. You're going to be speaking uh, you know, before people. And this is a great training ground to start. So, but if somebody wants to get into broadcasting, it's because I know where I went is completely different than college. How long do they actually have to go now? Is it, four, it's not four years, is it? No, this is a two year uh, community. No, I know Harvard Community College is a two year, mm -hmm. but if somebody wants to, you know, they want to get into broadcasting, if they go there for two years, do, do they get, then get their degree or do they have to go to another college after that? Well, they get their associates. A lot of, a lot of the students here will get their associates in mass comm. Okay. Um, yeah. And then, and then uh, a lot of them go on to do internships, or they're they're talking to me a lot about internships right now. Um, okay. And then, um, yeah, we we've also had good success in uh, students coming through our our mass communications program, going on to get their uh, bachelor's degree to four year mm -hmm. colleges, whether it's Towson, Salisbury, uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Uh, there have been a number of graduates that have gone on to the University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, Delaware also is one of the uh, universities where we've had students go to complete their four years. So, yeah, we have, we have a pretty good track record of sending them on uh, to four-year colleges. Okay. How many of them actually come back and talk to the students? Well, uh, that's one of the things we'd really like to do, especially as, as we move toward, uh, you know, setting up uh, a community advisory board, uh, right. to have some of the four former students come back and talk. Uh, we do have quite a number of successful students right here. Oh, I know. In the county area. Yeah. You know, and uh, so, I mean, a guy like Steve Clendenin, uh, mm -hmm. who is, is, is doing all kind of trailblazing things in commercial radio right now, uh, certainly would be a great speaker uh, to come in and talk to them. We had Oreo broadcasters come in. Uh, Jim Hunter has come by to talk. Oh, and, Nice. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we have our students. Kai Jackson came by uh, a few years ago. So, oh, uh, wow. yeah, we, we have pros uh, to come by and tell their stories. Uh, students lean forward because those stories are uh, unique, but at the same yeah. time, they can relate because it's part of what they're going through or going to be going through if they choose broadcasting as a career. Right. That's yeah. good. And, and a lot of them are working really hard on on their reels here, they're like recording their air checks, preparing like certain hours, like to make mm -hmm. sure that they record, and like they're making little like um, telegraph little reels of of stuff so they can send it off to to um, get their internships. You know, Paul, when you said reels, it took me back to when I was doing it, and when you said reels, it was actually on an reel actual to reel. reel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. now, now you say reels to kids, it's like the Instagram reels or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, now, Paul, how long have you been doing radio? Uh, I started in college in 92, so yeah, it's 30 years now. Okay, so you and Terry have seen the change oh, yeah. in radio. You guys want to just elaborate on that a little bit, how much radio has changed? Well, for me. Especially on the broadcaster part. Yeah, yeah. For, for me, Rich, I mean, you know, I, I go back, you know, I always told them I go back to the dawn of, of radio, which is not true, but uh, <laughs> certainly. You know, that it, golden it, age of radio yeah. podcast we were talking about. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, got a hand crank and everything, you know, to, to I'm get the character it, yeah. that's doing Johnny Dollar, you know, but 
Uh, you know, uh, the, the, thing, the thing is, um, you know, I've gone through all these different, seen all these different phases of radio all the way, for example, when I first got in and one of my mentors, I don't know if you know the name or not, he's, he's gone now, but Jack Alex, who used to be a uh, very popular Washington, D.C. Uh, disc jockey, he was my instructor, okay. my first instructor in broadcasting school. Uh, I was wow. still in the Air Force, as a matter of fact, when I had him as an instructor. So being at Andrews and the classes being uh, in D.C. Uh, was great. Right off Wisconsin Avenue is where the uh, training uh, facility was located. It was great to uh, begin my career with such a stellar professional. Uh, he taught me a lot, meaning that it was almost like a one-on-one. Today, mm-hmm. it's difficult. That's why... Um, Things like the learning lab, the student learning lab that we develop gets our students in one spot. Um, and then from there, heading out into the professional world uh, and at the same time also working on my degrees. You know, so I was a working professional, also a, a full-time student uh, right. at that time. And uh, so uh, getting into broadcasting at that time, AM was still pretty prevalent for me. So, you know, uh, one of the, the great stations I worked for was WCBM uh, when it was the oh, greatest, wow. when it was one of the greatest hits of all time uh, radio station. Uh, and uh, that started my career, uh, such R&B stations like WEBB and, you know, Win and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm just a, a baby DJ at that point, but I'm hanging around all of these great professionals and I'm just soaking it in, you know, and a lot of it was my initiative, my own self-initiative to really get in there you know, and not, you know, kind of to tell them, I don't just want to run and get coffee for you, but I actually want to sit down and I want to ask you questions. Right. So I can learn. Right. And then sooner or later, you know, someone comes along and says, Hey kid, get in there. You know, it's like, like in football, Hey, get in there kids. Let's see what you're made out of. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I rose to the challenge. My career started to, to go and go and go. Uh, then, uh, on the commercial end, um, as my career continued, uh, from the sort of smaller ma and pa type radio stations to the corporate level. And then you saw corporate come in and they pretty much just dissected commercial radio. Yes. Boom. And I'm going like, oh, it's got to be a better world out there. And I'd always been a big fan of public radio. And I said, you know what? Here's my time. My time is to go to public radio. And so, you know, I applied to different public radio stations and I was working part time at what was then WJHU. At, mm-hmm. at Johns Hopkins and doing jazz and uh, and uh, just you know doing part time stuff, uh, and then um, an opening uh, happened where I became the program director. Uh, soaked in everything I possibly could for public radio. I thought you know just great. I love love public radio. I love the research angle of it, uh, and, and the product, the quality of the product that's going on. Uh, and uh, so I made that my career path. And so I continued on and continued on and, and worked with different public radio stations throughout the uh, area, the nation. And um, then uh, got a call up here, you know, to come in and, and, uh, and do, uh, you know, become the operations manager here. Right. Uh, uh, under, you know, with Gary. And uh, so it was just a great experience uh, for me, but I knew there was more. And that more was to get student involvement. So so I'm sort of going full circle here to where I am right now. Uh, And in in a a good leadership uh, position for this radio station with a solid team, a very creative team uh, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and good support, you know, from the college. It's like all the factors are in place for this radio station to really grow as a college radio station with strong student involvement. So I know that's kind of long winded, but, you know, and I left out a lot of stuff, by the way, deliberately, Rich. <laughs> you know, it's like my, my, well, my resume is like 10 pages, man. <laughs> yeah. But you think about it. Cause when you started in radio and this is one of the things I big difference I saw the, the stations where we broadcast from the room was a lot bigger. Yes. Because you had the turntables, you had the cart machines, you had the reel-to-reel and everything. Now, it seems like you could be set up in a closet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can have a carol. Yeah. I I can see the difference from, you know, being in a big radio, big control room or, or, you know, room in the beginning to then as we got in like the 80s, then you had smaller studios. 
and you yeah. didn't have turntables in there. We, we were playing things off of carts, you know, yeah. and then pretty soon the carts were going. So then, yeah, you could take a little small area here and you could be broadcasting. That is what was able to lead to podcasting. So you have mm-hmm. young people, uh, you know, middle age, older, that's doing podcasting right from their bedroom, from their closets. Uh, you know, sometimes it's crowded in the closet, by the way. Uh, <laughs> their cars. No, no it's joke. amazing where you're doing them from. Yeah. And, you know, your car. I mean, I mean, as a voiceover uh, guy, I mean, I've actually done auditions from inside my car. And, and, and the, the guy on the other end said, oh, man, that really sounds good. Where are you? Are you you're in the studio? Uh, no, I'm inside of my car. This is really, <laughs> yeah. So it, oh, yeah, the te- it can technology anywhere. throughout the years is it's amazing how much it's changed. You gotta and, love it. You gotta love. Oh it. yeah, you do. You. I do. remember I, I was at WNYC when podcasting first started coming out, and people were just like, "What is this? this is like amateur hour?" I'm like, "No, this is get your game ready. This is yeah. Like, this is this is like." wild west and you should enjoy it because like there's going to be a lot more people out there telling stories oh yeah uh, it, well you it figured... took a long time like now it's a billion dollar industry but only in the last like five years but like, back then it was just like everybody's everybody's just like oh yeah no that's just people in their living rooms it's like yeah but they're gonna be the next storytellers and we should be listening to them to find good people to bring on and they're like oh no 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 no, no. but that was like public radio with capital p and capital r you know, that mm-hmm. was like, you know, we're the kings of the castle, you know. So and well, it, that always drove me nuts. <laughs> well, what was, I uh, I was looking at the numbers right before COVID started. Apple had, I think it was 700. 750,000. Right? Yeah, 750,000 podcasts. Mm-hmm. COVID started, they went over a million. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, the sad thing is a lot of now it's almost were, Now it's like a million five. Right. But. That doesn't, I mean, that number also includes the podcast where people stopped doing the podcast. Oh, yeah. 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 And that's a number I would like to see how many people stopped doing it because they thought it was easy. Mm-hmm. And it's not as easy as a lot of people think, especially if you're doing everything, the editing and everything else. Right. Well, that's, I but, mean, that's one of the things I'm teaching some of the students, like they have podcasts running and they, they ask me to listen to it. I'm like, what is your, what is your goal here? Well, I want to be a conversation. I want it to sound spontaneous and all this kind of stuff. And I know from editing podcasts professionally for like last 10 years, like spontaneous is a lot of work. Like you got to actually craft spontaneous. Yes. Right now, what you're doing is boring. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. You sound so, like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and this is going to be where? <laughs> You'll hear this, Rich. <laughs> Well, no, she can't. She can't listen to talk radio or podcasts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. just music. To, and when I started in radio, I hate. I couldn't do this. Mm-hmm. I could not yeah. talk. I mean, but I was. I loved playing the music. Yeah. But I mean, now, yeah. doing this, I I love it, and it's just. It seems like every podcast I do, I learn something new. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is what I love, and meet great people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is the other yeah, and, thing. And, and it was for, in my experience, I was at NYC from like 2099 to 2004. Mm-hmm. Um, 911 happened oh. and music was on the outs. It was all talk yeah. radio. And that's, yep. that's how these stations started to really make their money and make their mark. And public radio just turned almost entirely to, to talk radio and, you know, has remained there. The, 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 the music side of it is sort of, Bastard stepchild for yeah. for for places like NPR. I mean, you know, right. I was doing jazz from Lincoln Center for them for five years before before uh, right out of college, and like they they cut they slashed that budget by like two thirds after nine eleven. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Paul, what's your podcast? Uh, I mean, I work on some. I, I, I'm, I'm, You're I'm not most, doing I'm one. Mostly, I don't actually talk on one. I mean, I've talked, oh. I've done, I've been hosts for some that I've, I've worked on. Like uh, I did a one on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, oh, and that was, but that was like, you know, five years ago. I, right. Right now I'm, I'm technical directing two podcasts. One is the Downton Abbey official podcast. Cool. Uh, wow. Which, okay. which is for a friend of mine. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's you know, it is what it is. And then um, uh, uh, another one uh, called "Tell Me Something True," which is uh, one of my close friends and uh, a real friend of the station, Michael Elsesser. <laughs> he um, he was the program director at, at WNYC for a long time while I was there. And, but he started up this podcast with uh, this this woman, Laura McCowan. She's awesome. And, you know, they interview all sorts. And they're actually today in at South by Southwest in, in one hour doing an interview with Jason Isbell. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah. About about addiction and recovery. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So they're, it's going to be yeah. it's going to be really intense. I'll be getting that tape tomorrow morning. And they're gonna those are some of the best podcasts i love doing is about addiction yeah. and recovery yeah. and i can't tell you how many episodes i've done where i mean i was literally crying yeah uh, it, it's just uh. so now that you guys are also teaching podcasting to, i mean because i knew there is a difference but tell everybody like how it differs from teaching broadcasting to podcasting for you know if any because especially somebody wants to come in and learn and sign up for it right well i mean i'll 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 go first um for podcasting is almost is it's it's still a linear art like where you Mm -hmm. have to start begin the end but you could do it on your own time and you can and you can have more content more material and and you don't in the pacing can be um to your own style a lot of times when you're when you're teaching for radio you have to fit into like like i try to keep the station like sort of medium to fast paced Mm -hmm. and keep it moving try to keep the kids from going more than a minute or two at a time except for some of them that have a gift of the gab and they can tell a good story right um but but for the most part, I tell them to keep it short, keep the music going, keep the flow going. Um, but podcasting, you know, if uh, the actual art of storytelling in that way is is the sort of long form long form presentation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think of it as is like like what how I learned radio drama back in the day. You know, creating creating a sense of enclosure and creating a sense of space by seeing the whole thing from beginning to end and measuring it out doling it out piece by piece so that somebody can follow over a long course of time um but you know understanding that they're going to be like doing the dishes and like hearing their kids yell at them and all this kind of stuff at the same time so like you gotta keep it you gotta keep it loose and you know able to be picked up again so you know i think those two are kind of different in that way and and the FCC does not have anything to do with podcasting. Yet. No, yet. no, not yet. Well, you <laughs> know, yet. Joe Rogan might, might have changed that. Yeah. Joe Rogan, I think, is going to change that, that equation. Yeah. 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 And the other, I think the other big difference is people getting into broadcasting. If they're getting into broadcasting, you get a job at a station, you're going to be making money. If you want to get into podcasting, you're not necessarily going to be making money yeah. right away. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's, that's where the sales part comes in. Yeah, that's one of yeah. one of the the major challenges. I mean, uh, you know, I I'm a big podcasting fan, and mm-hmm. there are different areas, whether it's talking about business or leadership or you know broadcasting or voiceover or whatever, and very few that when I started listening to podcasting still exist, uh, and a lot of them had the, I, I think, um, which I guess you wouldn't call it a negative thought, uh, but they wanted to monetize it. But mm-hmm. there's really yet not been a, a formula. I mean, you know, I, I can't, you know, get an MBA in how to monetize podcasts. It, you, I mean, I don't, and yet I don't want to say it's a um, lucky type thing too. You got to work for it. You got to plan it out. Yeah. So. What I'm saying is that there has to be knowledge of the business angle of podcasting. Now, that in itself is a podcast because you don't hear much about it. As a matter of fact, I, I'm hard pressed to do any podcast that actually talks about the business of podcasting, the marketing aspect of it. Uh, you know, how do you get clients? Um, what are some of the subjects that you want to talk about, but yet not get too far away from what your core 
uh, appeal is. You know, yeah. so so there's always going to be some kind of a learning uh, curve for podcasting as it evolves. And yes, you're going to have you know your Joe Rogans, these guys are going to be you know knocking down millions. They're mm-hmm. fortunate, but the other ninety nine the other ninety nine percent are struggling to even make a profit. But I think a right. lot of it, Rich, is going to be someone coming up with some type of learning process for podcasters so that they, the, it's sort of like you got to go to school to be uh, an effective and, uh, and and earn money in podcasting. Uh, and hopefully, I mean, I might be giving an idea out right now. Maybe I'll come up with that, uh, especially with all the brain thrust that's around here in the college, uh, you know, so we'll see. Well, I think where a lot of people mess up with the podcast and as far as monetizing it goes, and this is where you guys have the perfect match because you're doing radio and podcasting. And this is the approach I took when I started my podcast. I a- approached different businesses about becoming sponsors and told them my idea, just as if I was selling a radio show. That's the way I, I approached it. Unfortunately, cause I'm on a, I follow a ton of different podcasting groups and you see people that, have never done radio, but are very successful at podcasting. And they're telling people you can only monetize your podcast. Once you sit hit a certain amount of downloads, and then you got to, you know, you're going to charge by how many downloads you get per thousand. That's the wrong way of doing it to me. It's. It, 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 I'm sure you guys can validate this when in radio, if you're going to launch a new show, you don't wait for that show to be on for a while before you get sponsors. You're going to get sponsors right away. Why not do the same thing with a podcast? And I think what the problem is, a lot of these podcasters are looking at the, the national companies Mm -hmm. to come on as sponsors. They're not looking right outside their window and that's what they need to do. Yeah. Yeah. The national national companies are the ones that are going to be looking at the number of downloads. Exactly. Okay. That's rarefied air. Okay. But for the average person that's doing a podcast, uh, again, going back to what I was saying, uh, and, and you make a good point, Rich, and that is don't wait <laughs> to go in, you know, X number of downloads before you go out to get clients. Mm-hmm. Go out now, just like in radio. We come up with an idea. There's maybe we create a, a one sheet about it, uh, and we do our research on uh, potential mm-hmm. clients, and we go out and we do a pitch, right? Uh, and I, again, that's part of, if you're a one man shop and you're doing podcasting, you're going to have to make that a part of your arsenal. If you want to make money, in other words, you can't get around it unless you just want to do a podcast for fun. There's some people just do it for fun. Which are Some people are. Yeah. 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 But if you're sitting there and you're, you're, uh, and, and one thing I wanted to say was crafting a business plan for your podcast. Again, it takes work. And yes. if you, if you're really serious about monetizing it, my advice would be just like any other business, craft that business plan, your marketing plan, your prospective targets and clients that are out there and go forth and make money. And get education on how to do it. Cause not everybody is a salesperson. True. And if, and that's the one thing I've always said, if, if you're going to run your own business, whether it's a B2B or B2C, you should know sales. You should also know some type of business management. I agree. Even if you didn't go to college or school for it, take courses. And that's the one thing, and and I'm sure you all can agree with this, but whether you become a podcaster, broadcaster, you know, even if you become a mobile DJ or whatever, the learning never stops. And, And Terry, you and I just talked about that with, you know, how radio has changed throughout the years. You know, now where we had to learn how to put a cart in or, you know, splice the reel to reels, right? everything is digital now. Mm-hmm. And it's even the boards have changed, but it's something you had to learn Yes, oh, yeah. throughout the years. Microphones, big thing. And you hear that all the time. I mean, I have several different microphones and some of them, yeah, not so good, but you know, you go with what you can afford at the time, mm-hmm. but you got to know the difference between your dynamics, your condensers and all of that. And 
what each one's going to do, when to use them, when not to use them. Right. And right. now three it, and now three hundred sixty degree mics too. Now. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's God. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. back to the local thing. A minute, because we've had somebody being pretty silent that does something oh, yeah. with a lot of the locals here. Who me? Matt? Me? Yeah. Wow. Local bands and all that. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, Rich. That's uh, our community outreach show, and uh, it's the show that I run here called Fresh Tracks. And what we do on Fresh Tracks is we we search and find out those those hidden gems. You know those those local musicians here in Harford County and uh, hey, the Maryland area. I'll, I, we even do uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia and you know, folks that are local, you know, they, they may not be, you know, Avril Lavigne or Blake Shelton, but they are so very deserving of a community. Some of them are better. Oh yeah, exactly. That's, that's Seriously. the thing. I mean, some of these people are just phenomenal. I mean, they, they literally are, you know, and could and will, I have no doubt, be, you know, these amazing, mm -hmm. well-known musicians. And the whole idea for Fresh Tracks is to give these community members, these local musicians, a platform to be able to be heard and for the public to hear them and to realize who they are, where they can find them. It, it, I think it gives these artists here in the county and beyond a, a just this much, much needed platform, this deserving platform uh, for them to get their message out to the community. So that's that's the whole idea with the show Fresh Tracks. And uh, to to this day, actually, three years ago, we started this show. So it's right. actually the anniversary of Fresh Tracks. <laughs> and uh, so three years we've been doing this now at WHFC. And I think it's something that, you know, we've always wanted to do and you know until we had the manpower whfc you know now we can do it and i we have had over i'd say at least over a hundred different artists on fresh tracks now really and it's the, the number is only going to keep growing i would love to find a way to archive fresh tracks into a podcast and uh you know dealing with some of the <laughs> legal issues of of putting music you know on the internet uh but at the very same time i think that having some kind of an archival fashion for this show uh really will be a boon to the public and to these musicians you know where it can be embedded in things like social media but uh, yeah, that's that's Fresh Tracks. That's just one of uh, the unique shows that we're developing and have developed well, I think, uh, at WHFC. And with them, you're not just playing their music. You're actually interviewing them as well, right? Yes. I mean, sometimes we don't always have them available to interview, especially with COVID. Right. When COVID well, hit, yeah. it, it knocked everything out. Uh, but I, I still try to, to find folks to interview over the telephone lines. They would call in. But yeah, I, it's, it's music and conversation with uh, these local artists. In fact, I, I, the last two musicians I just had was I had a Baltimore jazz vocalist and arranger, Irene Yalenti, and yes. she just played at the Cultural Center at the Opera House. And wow, is she just an amazing vocalist, just, just beautiful voice. Uh, and yesterday I interviewed the Rhythm Surf Monkeys, uh, just another one of uh, <laughs> the county's uh, hidden treasures. And I, I don't even want to say hidden. I think they're, they're pretty well known. And uh, that's the whole idea of Fresh Tracks is to give uh, these musicians the attention that they do deserve. All right. So, Matt, Sir. Yeah, because everybody that does a show, they have like their dream list of different guests they would like to have on yeah who's who who's in your top five my top five yeah for lo for local artists that you would like to get on and haven't been able to get to yet have well i i did have kelly bell from the kelly bell band on okay and that was about two years ago but i love kelly bell and yes. he he is oh man he is such an exciting guy and super funny 
And uh, I would love to have Kelly Bell back on again and uh, see what new music that he's come up with. Mm-hmm. Um, if I had to stretch a little farther north, uh, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm in love with Cindy Bradley. She's just got really good music. Uh, she's a jazz artist. Wow. And I would love to have Cindy Bradley on, on to Fresh Tracks. Um, I'm trying, I'm drawing a blank, but I'll, I'll, I'll circle back around to that and I'll, 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 I'll tell you some more, but, uh, yeah, I, I think right now the next person I would love to have on would be Kelly Bell once again. And, uh, right. I, I've just, I really enjoy <laughs> Kelly. He's a gas, uh, to talk to, and I, I'd love to have uh, him back on Fresh Tracks. So, you know, there's a, there's a person there that works at the college and very, well known, I guess you could say, in the music field around here, Brad Cox. Yeah, Did you get him on yet? I have. Oh yeah, I've gotten okay. Brad Cox on. Oh for sure. Yep, I've had Brad Cox and uh, his mu- music from the group Vendetta. And oh. uh, yeah, I have his newest album. I've I've played it. I've interviewed Brad. Um, yeah, just a super talented artist. And an- another local artist is HCC's uh, another HCC. Um, full-timer is Mark Bandy. <laughs> he's really, yeah, he used to play in a band. I think, no, he still plays with a group, uh, a band called rough cut. And, uh, they used to be the house band for, um, club 66 out in Edgewood yes. many years ago, but, uh, he still plays with them. And he just gave me a whole bunch of his music. So I, another person, now that you mentioned, I want to have on is Mark Bandy and the group Rough Cut. Wow. I didn't realize that he worked there. Oh yeah. Mark, Mark is uh, here at Harvard Community College. Man. There's, there's so many talented people Rich, oh, there are. here in the county. I mean, that so much talent, uh, great vocalists, great composers and arrangers, um, a young friend of mine uh, I, I interviewed recently, Andre Sholgach. He's uh, a local Harford Countyan as well, and he does scores now uh, for film, TV, and video games. And I mean, some of these folks, they live right here in your neck of the woods, and mm-hmm. they're just, you know, they're moving and shaking, man, and they're, they're, they're blazing trails. People don't realize how many talented musicians there are here in Hartford County. Oh, there's so many. Uh, oh, God. speaking of, Ed, have you, and I don't know if you've had them on or not because, well, COVID probably would have been the easiest time because a lot of people weren't touring. Um, but him and his band have toured nationally. And actually, I saw them at Pier 6. They opened up for a band called Revolution. Howie Spangler. Do you know who I'm talking about? I haven't said the van, but his name is Howie. Howie Spangler. It sounds familiar. What's the band? You know what? And now I'm drawing a blank. Oh, Ballyhoo. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have heard of Ballyhoo. That's, okay. yes, that's, that is another group that I have reached out to. I've reached out. I did reach out to Ballyhoo. I reached out to a group called Tip of the Whisker. Um, wow. Just so many different people. And yeah. Yeah so many talented folks in this county and let me let me tell you i i, I have a laundry list i i do of course <laughs> now that you ask it of me I, i'm like me i'm just blanking I, but you know that's that's just on the spot stuff i guess but i've had some guests on my show that i didn't know were musicians and during the show when they slipped and told me Nothing better than putting them on the spot and having them sing. <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? How does that go? <laughs> Actually, you know what? I had a young lady on, and now she co-hosts with me sometimes, um, her, Dr. Colleen Curran. And she plays in a band out of Baltimore. They do like uh, like the, the ska, reggae stuff. But man, we, she told me, and I asked, I put her on the spot and asked her to sing. And I, I turned around so I couldn't see her. Cause I almost like the voice. I was blown away. Wow. I mean, she just, Oh my God. It, it was amazing. Moves the soul. Amazing. Huh? Wow. Oh God. Yeah. It, it just, it, it moved. It, it was, it, oh, oh, oh. I get, I get shivers. Uh, yeah. It just reminded me about it. It just, 
and, and once in a while you'll hear that you'll hear that musician that just you're just memorized or mesmerized by them it's um and speaking of which because there's another one and i know terry knows who i'm talking about and i hope i get the name right and if you haven't had him on yet matt shame on you benny russell oh isn't yeah. he from here of course yeah i've had professor benny russell well, why is oh, terry yeah. laughing Benny, I, I have had Benny Russell's music yeah. on. I sure have. Okay. He is a another one of uh, the county's treasures. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, I could listen to that all day. It's like, but I just had another guy on. If you can't get a hold of him, he's from here. Um, the funny thing, he's released two albums. I don't know if you say albums if it's only on Spotify and Apple now. I don't know. Um, but very talented. And his name is, he goes by Jules K. Julian Ketchum is his name, but very talented musician. I'll, you know what? I also have to send you the links, Matt, because yeah, please do. Obvious, I had him on it. And before he came on, I actually listened to his music. And I, I, wow. Okay. You have, you'll have, Terry, you would love it too. Okay. Yeah. So, would you, so would you, Paul. I mean, the guy is very talented. And uh, anyways. Yeah, please, please do. Please do. So one of the things, you know, we talked about how radio has changed from going to the carts to digital. But you guys still have some shows where they actually use records, correct? Oh, yeah. That's right. To get that yeah. good quality sound. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Still, there's still, you still can't beat the sound of vinyl. No. Yeah, and, 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 I mean, and vinyl's back. I mean, yes. you know, the vinyls. The, those old dollar bins of, of vinyl records they used to be able to find at the stores. Now they're like ten, twenty dollar bins. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> now, now it's a thing again, which is great. I mean, I love it. So, it, and we have at least half a dozen um, students volunteers that bring LPs in every week. Well, yeah, now you got even the bands today when they release a new album, they're actually doing it on vinyl. And yeah. something else I heard is making a comeback, which I always thought was a pain: cassettes. Yeah, I yeah. hate I'm... putting the pencil in there. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of fun. It's a real pain. Heck yeah, yeah, but you know, yeah. You, you, I mean, I, I grew up with cassettes. I mean, like to, to have a cassette where you can just like tape something you really like and then yeah. tape over it with something new you really like and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's, yeah, there's, there's a reason I kept my, my little cassette Walkman. It's um, my oh, kids you still have that. one. Oh yeah. I Wait, do. Do you have, do you still have an eight track player? I wish I never had an eight track player. I asked my parents every week for an eight track <laughs> player, but they instead bought a CD player in like 1985, 84. Oh, so, so Paul's one of these youngins, Terry, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. He's a young one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I've, I've used everything. Like I, I, I was going to ask you. I'm waiting for the '78 to come back. Yeah, I yeah. still have some. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And, and actually, yep. still have a, a record player because it wasn't a turntable then. That'll play '78s. Wow. Too. Yeah, my uh, my brother in law actually has '16s. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, you can't find a record player. No. I mean, if you can, you're going to pay an arm and a leg for it. True. You gonna throw um, that in the old cylinder? <laughs> you know what? I, in all honesty, I would love to find an old what was it, Victrola uh, mm -hmm. cylinder? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know. Uh, what's the antique place up in the Havre Grace? Bahukas. They had one before, and I wanted to buy it, but it's. I'd be afraid to play it, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Paul, I love that sound. Yeah, Paul and I were talking about that the other day because it's just yeah. so cool. The sound of it. Yes. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's totally different. So something real important about college radio that we didn't hit on. And for the listeners out there, I don't think they realize this with college radio. It, it, well, it's because of college radio that a lot of bands have become famous yeah. because especially back in the day, their music could not be played on commercial radio because it was too long. Right. You know, and I don't know. If, well, there I'm sure there's still bands out there like that. Uh, but you guys want to touch on that briefly because a lot of people don't realize like that's where Kansas and some other bands got their start. Yeah, yeah. And when I used to tour around the, the country with my bands like 20 years ago, 
we used to stop at college stations in every town before the show and, and play, you know. And um, now um, we're trying to get a critical mass of local music and you know get more and more more local bands in so that every day we'll have a feature in every hour we're going to have a local band track playing right you know, to get the, their names out for the local bands and then eventually when when it's going to when we can actually figure out the studios and we can have like live performances and stuff i would love to like start inviting touring like bands to come through and like and, and and like come at least do an interview if not like do a an acoustic performance or something like oh yeah that's that's the lifeblood of college radio you, you can just like just on a on a dime just like bring somebody in and do a live performance you know paul did i hear you say when you played in a band <laughs> yeah of course yeah. <laughs> it's different it was uh, a different life <laughs> uh-huh what did you play in that band drums oh so you didn't do lead vocals yeah, no, I hung out with the musicians. Oh, man, I was hoping I would get somebody to sing on yeah, this. He's, he's trying to get you to sing, Paul. <laughs> I, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> I tried. I tried. So, no, I, um, you guys have anything to add whatsoever? I, I would like to say one thing, Rich, uh, that WHFC, one of the things that I do being a community outreach specialist is that we really do want to partner with like-minded organizations here. We've started the Radio Learning Lab, uh, Paul, what, about a year ago, Terry? About yeah. a year ago, would yeah. you say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it really has thrown the doors wide open to not just the community, but the entire student body here. And it really has become very popular. So we're, we're always looking to help local organizations get the word out about who they are, what they do and what benefits that they offer this community here in Hartford County. And that's really what the heart of WHF, one of the hearts of WHFC, <laughs> we have many hearts. We're all heart, but that's one of the big ones is, is that keeping the public empowered, uplifted, and helping to keep business organizations uh, of many different kinds uh, top of mind. So we're always here. We're always looking to partner with folks who appreciate higher learning initiatives such as ours and, uh, you know, who want to help out, you know, and in any way possible. But, you know, we we're, we're always grateful for any donations and for any underwriting that uh, they can provide WHFC. And uh, we're eager uh, to partner with these uh, folks while we still have some air we're we're having a lot uh underwriting is up we're having folks come on to the air so while we while we still have some room and uh, if they do want to get started i want to just let them know that they can reach out to me 443-412-2605 or they can email me at m-a-t-e-r-r-y at harford.edu and i'll help them get started Yo, man, I'm glad you brought that up. Explain to everybody listening, especially business owners, the big difference from underwriting versus advertising on commercial radio. Well, the big difference with underwriting on public radio versus commercials, commercials, they have that very commercially sound, you know, where they... Mm -hmm. You know, they, they give calls to action where they're like, you know, act now, don't delay, you know, and uh, they they can give, you know, things like, you know, quantity, quality comparisons and urgencies and calls to action. Whereas with underwriting, it maybe is it's it's there's none of that. It's I don't want to say it's formal. There's a lot of things that you can say in underwriting on public radio. There's things that you can't necessarily say, but, you know, there are there are some of those subtle differences where maybe it, it's a little bit more formal, but the whole idea is, is still to get the message out about who you are, what you do and where can the public find you. But underwriting has a, a very public radio -y kind of a tone to it. Whereas with, you know, commercial airspace, it sounds, <laughs> you know, super enthusiastic, uh, you know, a lot more, you know, tons of energy, you know, we, we, you can't have any kind of background music to punch it up or, mm -hmm. or anything like that. You know, you have to make it sound sensible 
and forthright and honest. And that's that's one of uh, the the big differences, really, with underwriting versus commercial radio. But can, as I, far can as I add something there? Sure, sure, please, Paul. Um, in a sense, like commercial, commercial, like commercial radio commercials, advertising, uh, it's transactional. It's mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. You know, this is this is this is what you're going to get. This is this is we're the best person you can come find. Um, with the underwriting, and especially since I mean we're a, a, a state institution, we're a college, and we are the voice of that college. In a lot of ways, it's us thanking the 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 company or the organization for supporting us and saying like, here's the information for all of you who are listening. Here's the information for somebody who cares about what we're doing here. And we thank that that organization. And here's how you can find them if you'd like. You know, that's you know, it's it's more turned around. Like, right? We're we're actually you know, appreciate we're showing our appreciation for what they do. Yeah, we're we're leaving the door open for the listener, and we're giving them the agency to walk through and to yeah. experience and try these businesses. And the other thing is, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the College is nonprofit, right? Yes. Which yes, means, is. so if they're underwriting, they're donating to a nonprofit. So mm-hmm. come tax time, that plays a big role, and it's a key difference from, say, commercial radio to, you know, public radio, right? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When you, it is considered uh, a tax deduction for your tax purposes when you donate to WHFC. Okay. Right. Yeah. Cause I, I don't think a lot of businesses realize that. And you guys, to me, you guys are true public radio or true local radio. Um, and the, and actually, yeah, tell everybody that because I know you have listeners in England because my cousin tells me all the time because he's, over there i know you have listeners in florida you know thanks to the internet Mm -hmm. but just with radio alone tell everybody how you know far you guys broadcast because it's not just bel-air right yeah yeah we you know we for example right now i'm looking at the the coverage map here Okay. okay so you can kind of see that the inner band strictly is uh, in the Bel Air area. Then you get to the outer band where you're going a little more north, a little more south, uh, out over uh, the water there. Uh, we, our signal can get down into like the White Marsh area, mm-hmm. but, but that's the outer reaches there. And then up into our uh, past Darlington, uh, up into little portions of Pennsylvania, uh, over to the eastern shore. Now, occasionally what will happen is you'll actually have like like a, like a skip where this actually goes way out to the bay. Right. And, and out and, and we've had individuals who have uh, donated to us during our fundraiser that's out off the bay. And we're sitting here going, gee, I mean, it's a great thing that they're doing this, but wow, I didn't know the signal came out that way. And uh, I know when I was uh, along route 50, my wife and I were headed toward vacation in ocean city that there were skips where the station signal was coming in there. So it was right. interesting, which is rewarding. But the main thing is that we want to super serve our local area, which is a Bel Air area here. And then those reaching, you know, reaching out. Um, and I think recently, uh, Matt, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, we have also uh, attracted some businesses that are out near White Marsh, a little bit more south. Yeah. Yeah, we have. We've had a few businesses out in White Marsh come talk to us. Um, I we've even had uh, one or two people from uh, in the upper Pennsylvania region. Uh, you know, they've they've caught us by the stream. So we're we're pretty much everywhere. I mean, looking at some of our where our podcasting is reached, because we do have things like HCC 360, which keeps mm-hmm. the public informed of all of Hartford Community Colleges. Um some of our, our most best offerings uh, to the community. And we have the Owl's Nest, which is kind of a more informal, you know, interview about, you know, different Harford Community College goings ons and employees. And people are listening in places like Alaska. You know, they're listening in 
Iceland and in Ireland. So we're we're getting, you know, we're touching people. We're touching people all over the all over the planet. Did you guys ever think back in the day before the internet and everything, you would ever be working at a station where you would have listeners in another country or something? <laughs> Not off the top Not of my head, no. Yeah. But no. yeah, unless it was <laughs> atmospheric skip, and then most of the time, you know, that would be within the United States. Yeah, but but, but that's that's so rare. Um, you know, it's it's incredible. I remember when I was uh, on college radio, uh, and I got uh, we we'd gotten a phone call in from someone who was in Bangor, Maine. And we said, wait a minute, the signal can't possibly get to Bangor, Maine, right? But it was an atmospheric skip. They actually had picked up the frequency. And they, they called and said, hey, this is some great music. you got." I was playing jazz in the afternoon. He said, this is great. You know, the music that you have on it. So where are you calling from, sir? He says, I'm calling from Bangor, Maine. I said, hey, this is, is this a joke? This is a prank phone call. Come on. <laughs> yeah. No. And, and, and he took the phone and he put it down to the radio. And sure enough. Doesn't That's that feel crazy. good, though? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very good. I mean, that, yeah. yeah. And that's one of the things I love because I, I've had people contact me from San Jose, California, Texas, and all that have heard the podcast. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's we, okay. That's pretty, yeah, Rich. We, we've had folks in Chicago before uh, call us to uh, tell us that they're listening to, like, the nighttime jazz. So, yeah. It's... Yeah. Yeah. it's all over the place you know our our podcasting our our streaming signal it it's reaching folks in every nook and cranny of the globe yeah i love it i, I never thought that you know it would radio or well of course back then netcasting would would be as big as it is now and thank god for the internet which has made radio even bigger and it, it's God, now you can hear Terry Troyer anywhere. That's right. Of course, if all the voiceover work and TV and everything you're doing, they're hearing you everywhere. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I know. They, I'm, I'm on quite a few things. It's just like, oh, so, you know, what, I heard your voice on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I recorded that like four weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> it's all rewarding. It's all good. Uh, also, Rich, let me mention too that one of the ways that we're able to uh, bring dollars into our college radio station is through our on-air fundraising. And I'm sure you're familiar mm -hmm. with that. Okay. And we have, uh, you know, we're, we're constantly uh, being creative in, in that aspect. Uh, whereas before it would, you know, possibly be a two week onslaught of fundraising on the air, uh, backing it off for a week, uh, positioning at certain times that we feel will be more effective to reach the listener or the supporter out there. Uh, having uh, messages, constant messages that would be going on uh, throughout the day. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 get, and actually, we've gotten quite a number of uh, individuals who are contributing. And also, uh, I got a real nice phone call the other day, a lady who was listening to uh, the jazz starting with Dave May on Tuesday evening and going right through. She was very complimentary in liking not only the jazz, the blues, uh, what uh, Big Jim was doing with his show, into our overnight programming, you know, uh, the bird's nest. Um, and uh, so, I mean, or night bird, excuse me, right? Am I correct? Night bird, bird. Yeah. Yes. yes. The yeah. night bird, the night bird. Uh, and uh, she was very complimentary because she says, oh, you know what? This is music that I remember hearing, you know, and, and, and the jazz is fantastic. So it's rewarding things like that where we're actually able to hit that potential donor at any time of the day. Yes. You know, and so, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're being as creative as we possibly can be uh, with that. Yeah, I mean, we, we were trying to do experiment and stuff. And like, I still get phone calls like I got one a couple of days ago from this really <laughs> sort of like sounded like a, a, a old gang, gangster or something. He was just like, <laughs> you, you, he was like. You keep playing the Armand Brothers, we'll keep sending checks. <laughs> you betcha. This is great. No, don't break the leg, okay? Yeah. okay. Give me stage <laughs> <Pearl> blues. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, so we were experimenting with that for the last, you know, four months or so. But the students have been coming to me 
over the last couple months as well saying hey you remember that time when we like all like like paired up and like talked and, about like donating and all that kind of stuff can we do that again i was like what yeah <laughs> you, want, you want to do a fun drive again and they're like yeah let's do a fun drive that was that was super fun <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> sure. So we, we scheduled one uh, the first week of April. It's going to start on oh, the 4th. Nice. Yeah, from the 4th to the 10th. And it's going to be really loose. It's not going to be like, um, you know, kind of hit you over the head, public radio. Um, please, please, please. It's going to be, you know, the students are going to fill up as much time as they can. And other and other times we're going to have just like some messages during the hours to, right. to, to keep it, you know, keep it at, at top of mind. But you know, the students want to get on the air and they want to ask the community for, for support for what we're doing at the learning lab because they're, they love it. And explain to everybody the importance of donating to the station. Well, we run, we, we get some financial uh, institutional help, but a lot of our budget is pulled from listener support. And, you know, um, we have, I mean, we're, we are about to change up uh, a major piece of equipment for our automation, uh, which we're lucky enough to get a grant for. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't have, to, you didn't have the cash for that. Um, but we still have like 20, 30 year old pieces of equipment that are actively breaking, you know? <laughs> we, yeah. So, you know, we, we have things that are falling apart. Our computer system is 20 years old. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, That's older have, than Matt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, a little bit, just a little bit, you know. Well, his voice is changing. So. Yeah. so it's you know, it's 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 gum gum and twist ties, a lot of, a yeah. lot of stuff. So we need we we need to if we're going to teach these kids how to do the right, like to to really be professionals in radio, yeah. um, and also I mean, just the kids that are coming to have fun, like they're they're learning a lot of like transferable skills in that way like we can't have stuff breaking on them constantly you know yeah you gotta te teach That's them how to use the real stuff well hey, didn't you guys just get the roadcaster pro for the we did. um yeah it's a gem. podcast part it, it's a gem it, it, it that really is, is. oh yeah. yeah and you can do so much and uh again it's where our young students just take to it like that boom yes mm -hmm. it's great yeah i i <laughs> love using a console like that now it beats carrying the laptop mm -hmm. i think yeah. just carrying the case with the microphones is heavier than actually <laughs> carrying the control board now yeah. Yeah. you know but well i want to thank you guys so much and i want to i want to offer you something um especially now you know the students are so active and you said they're writing scripts and they have the ability the ability to record record um, one of the things I do now for my podcast, I can actually put in dynamic content, which is, you know, radio spots before the podcast or after the podcast. So if you would, you know, do them and don't worry about just for the fun drive, do it anytime and send them to me and I'll start playing them, you know, either before and after the podcast. That's a this, deal. And Terry, you may have gotten the email about that because that's one of the changes I'm actually making with Harford County Living. Yeah. Uh, yeah another way to get the word out more. Yeah. Yes, so that's great. Guys, that's your email. Yeah. Send that to me if Kermit wants to do it. I mean, <laughs> hi-ho. We're on the Harford County Living podcast with Rich Bennett. Yay! <laughs> God. Okay. I'm afraid. Who's going to do Miss Piggy now? <laughs> Oh, oh God, why did I ask? <laughs> Terry, Matt, Paul, thanks again. And I want to say congratulations because to me, the, the station has made it a complete turnaround. And like I said before, I have a lot of people that have been contacting me that are loving it. And, you know, you're to me, you are truly local. So congratulations and thanks again. Thank you. Thank thanks you for Rich. having it's us, Rich. A pleasure oh, having my pleasure. I want to thank Terry, Matt, and Paul for coming on to the podcast. And if you have any interest in getting into broadcasting or even podcasting, 
and you live here in Harford County, check out Harford Community College. They have some great programs, even if you want to get into something else. They have some great programs, so it's worth looking into. I've been doing this for years, you could say. I mean, I've had my own DJ business since 86. Uh, Got into radio shortly after that. Got out of radio, started podcasting, and I love it. I, I just love it. I said I wanted to recommend the podcast at the end of each episode. And, of course, I'm going to. What better podcast to coincide with this episode than HCC 360? It's a new talk show highlighting the variety of important and interesting offerings at Hartford Community College. From workforce training, forensics classes, a new biotech program, to summer camps and cultural arts performances. HCC 360 reflects that there's something for everyone at Harford Community College. Students of WHFC's Radio Learning Lab, which you heard about on this podcast, prepare and conduct the interviews and produce the series. You can actually go to ChesapeakePodcastNetwork.com forward slash HCC 360 and listen to it. If you have any interest in coming on to the podcast or if you have any ideas or would like somebody else on, just go to conversationswithrichbennett.com. Again, that's conversationswithrichbennett.com. You'll see a link there for when to be a guest. Just click on that, fill out the form, and I'll get everything set up. Until next time, my name is Rich Bennett. Thanks for joining the conversation. I want to share an amazing experience I had with Tar Hill Construction Group when I needed to install a new roof on my home. Let me tell you, they are truly a cut above the rest. Tar Hill Construction Group is an award-winning residential and commercial roofing and exteriors contractor focusing on roofing, siding, gutters, and solar solutions. Proudly serving Baltimore, Harford, and Cecil counties, they make it their priority to make a positive impact in the communities they serve first while providing exceptional services in roofing and exteriors. From start to finish, Tar Heel Construction Group proved to be a reputable and dependable contracted solution. Their quality installations and good communication kept me informed and reassured throughout the entire process. It's no wonder they have been voted Harford's Best Roofing Contractor and Best Home Improvement Contractor for three years running. But here's what really impressed me. Tar Heel Construction Group's commitment to continued service and registered warranties. They stand behind their work, ensuring that I have peace of mind for years to come. What's even more remarkable is their dedication to giving back to the community. They aggressively support and uplift the neighborhoods they serve, making a positive difference in people's lives. I feel incredibly grateful and humbled to have chosen Tar Hill Construction Group for my roof. They have earned my trust and respect for being the only contractor to be voted Harford's best roofing contractor and Baltimore's best roofing contractor in the same year. So if you're looking for top-notch roofing and exterior solutions, look no further than Tar Hill Construction Group. Visit their website at tarheelconstructiongroup.com or give them a call at 410-638-7021. Again, that's 410-638-7021. Experience the excellence and community impact for yourself. Tar Hill Construction Group, building excellence one roof at a time.